It's my great privilege and pleasure now to introduce today's presenters, Joshua Smith and Wendy Troxell. Josh has been an active member of NACADA for six years. He served as chair of the research committee, and he currently serves on the NACADA Council, representing the administrative division. In terms of his own research background, Josh holds a PhD in educational psychology and methodology from the University at Albany. He's an assistant professor of educational psychology and director for the Center for Urban and Multicultural Education in the Indiana University School of Education, Indianapolis. His research focuses on educational transitions broadly with an emphasis on the transition from middle school to high school and from high school to college. Josh has published several articles on academic advising that look at transitions as well as students' perceptions of advising. As director for the Center for Urban and Multicultural Education, he works with partners in P16 and community-based organizations to co-create inquiry questions and conduct research that will directly respond to those questions, ultimately helping to inform future decisions. Josh uses a framework of translating research into practice, which he will explain during the broadcast. Wendy has been involved with NACADA for about four years, and she's a member of the research committee. She served as a faculty member for two winter institutes and has presented at regional and national conferences. She's on the faculty at Illinois State University in the Department of Educational Administration and Foundations, and she teaches research methods courses in both quantitative and qualitative methodologies, program evaluation and assessment, and college students and their cultures. Her research interests are in the area of teaching, learning, and advising in the first year of college, the impact of formative assessment techniques in the classroom, faculty and staff roles in the program assessment process, and the identification of teaching skills in pre-college students. Prior to her faculty position, Wendy served as the director of the University Assessment Office. Wendy earned her doctorate in educational leadership at the University of Alabama at Birmingham where she was also the director of undergraduate admissions, with special emphases in both educational research and educational law. I believe Josh is going to get us started today, so I'll turn the mic over to him now, and we'll begin. Thank you, Lee, and uh, welcome, everybody. It's really a, a privilege to spend some time with you this afternoon. And while we only have a short time together, uh, Wendy and I articulated some goals for the webinar, some of which will only scratch the surface, unfortunately. But hopefully by addressing the following goals that you can see on your screen here, you can take away what, you've, what we've discussed here and sort of move forward with it um, at your own pace and, and continue to interact with us in the future. The first goal that we have is articulate a new framework for scholarly inquiry and advising. Number two, share the current strategies, approaches for infusing research across NACADA. Three, we're going to discuss data collection and analysis across the, what we call the quantitative qualitative continuum. Four, identify the strengths and limitations of research examples uh, that Wendy and I have conducted in our respective institutions. And then five, we're going to do, uh, spend a little time at the very end uh, generating ideas for future inquiry under an umbrella that we're going to call hot topics. And we'll look forward to some input from you on that as well. As we begin our time together, I think it's important that we acknowledge in, in the audience we likely have a wide range of professionals within the academic advising community. We will explore a number of research-related topics. We'd like to frame this discussion under the, the part of the title after the colon of the webinar, which is, uh, quote, unquote, multiple pathways to conducting research and academic advising. So in order to do that, I think we must acknowledge up front that we can view research through a number of lenses. The first lens that we could look through is the position that you're in. Considering the configuration of the type of advising that you have at your institution and the students that you serve. For example, you're working with first students, uh, students in the major, graduate students, uh, non-majors, etc. Secondly, let's consider the problem that you're trying to solve. You know, what's working, what's not working related to a given strategy, project, or program that you have in your advising unit. Third, let's think about the proof that you're being asked to show. Uh, what kind of accountability pressures are you facing? And who, who, is this, who is the audience for this? 
Um, is this for provost? Or is this for your in internally? Uh, or something that you want to accomplish uh, as an individual? Fourth is the collaborations that you're part of. Often we think of research in as an isolated event, but it's not. Uh, where are the natural linkages, the committees, the faculty, uh, faculty and staff working together uh, for the multiple benefits of the program, of the advising unit? Fine, uh, but lastly, the other audience is formal graduation. And a lot of uh, graduate students who, are, who contact the research committee and interested in um, doing conducting research on advising uh, for a, plot, a project, a thesis, or a dissertation. So as we continue uh, the webinar today, I want you to consider uh, the possible and appropriate venues for research within your context or within your world, for example. Last year, I had the great honor uh, to work with a, a really wonderful group of colleagues in Ipata uh, on the Task Force for Infusing Research Throughout Advising. One of the first charges of that group was to come up with a new definition or revised definition, I guess you would say, of research and academic advising. And we came up with this one, and you can see it on your screen. Nakata views research as scholarly inquiry into all aspects of advising or action, the role of advising in higher education, and the effects that advising can have on students. It regards consuming and producing research as the collective responsibility of all members of the higher education advising community, including advisors, faculty, administrators, and students. We had a little bit longer definition when we started, uh, and the group originally came up with two additional sentences um, that I've shared with you on the next slide here. And as you, as you can see, it kind of built, the approach builds upon and extends Boyer's uh, scholarship of discovery, integration, application, and teaching. The extension is towards praxis, where research theory and practice and academic advising represent inter interrelated processes for understanding and advancing student development and success. Well, I still think that's a good definition. Um, we later de uh, decided with some input from others and, and uh, a lot of good feedback that those last two sentences probably don't need to be in the public viewing of our definition of academic advising for Nakata um, because it does require a little bit further explanation of, of Boyer and, and what he was trying to do uh, in this notion of praxis. Uh, so in terms of the definition for academic advising, the, the task force was very pleased and the board did approve uh, that earlier definition uh, that we showed. For our purposes today, though, I think it's important to look at Boyer's influence uh, on research and scholarship in higher education and how it's impacted our current thinking of research in higher education, specifically in academic advising. Boyer called for the extension of research beyond that of discovery, and he had in mind a framework that respected and the development of research that could be applied, and he looked toward collaborative inquiry across disciplines that was, in fact, integrated. And he also added a piece on the scholarship of teaching and learning, which not long after that, Lee Shulman takes up in the uh, first volume of the Journal of Scholarship Teaching and Learning. Both really called for greater attention to how we are um, thinking about, investigating, and making modifications and improvements to the quality of teaching and learning in higher education. I feel that it's in with these three realms that research and advising finds a meaningful home and it has a responsibility responsibility to contribute to the fine body of knowledge in higher education. Now, it's not to say that discovery research is not valued or important in, in the academy or in, within academic advising. I think it is. What I'm suggesting here is that we not privilege discovery research over other types of scholarship. The three approaches is integration, application, and the scholarship of teaching and learning uh, reflect what I call in my center, the Center for Urban and Multicultural Education education, a translational research, or translating research into practice, or TRIP. Pick one of those three. Um, while it may be intuitive, I do find it amazing and somewhat troubling um, that much of what we learn in, in research in um, K-12 and in higher education typically does not find a home uh, in the practice of teaching and learning. And if it does, it generally takes many years uh, for a practice that's been studied, if you will, to really enter and be infused in the college classroom, the K-12 classroom, or a student affairs, a pra uh, practice, or approach. Some replication research is funded by the federal government or state uh, departments of education, for instance, but rarely do I see a commitment on faculty and teachers to examine how interventions, pedagogical approaches, and other programs operate in various conditions, transferring the findings uh, into another setting um, and doing conducting research that can be replicated in other areas. 
Trip research or translating research into practice requires commitment to sharing data just in time. That just in time manner so that teachers, advisors, and community members can use the data to inform decisions. Relational research has found a home in the professional disciplines such as medicine, nursing, social, and recently teaching. These areas are attempting to change the landscape of how research is viewed and used in respective disciplines. Part of making this a reality involves confronting the rich practice gap that exists in the minds and hearts, in some cases, of uh, faculty, administrators, and practitioners. We don't want to spend too much time rehashing the old debates. We could spend a whole webinar on that. Um, but the way we see research practice gap really informs our, uh, our, our thinking and our increased research, uh, increased emphasis, let's say, on research by academic advisors for academic advisors. We look to the 2000 when Kazar reported on a series of focus groups at higher education conferences. According to her research, um, we haven't made much progress in the, in, throughout the 90s and 80s and 90s uh, from moving from a purely or primarily uh, discovery research paradigm to one that values applied research in higher education. In her study with faculty and student affairs professionals at higher education conferences over a two-year period, she concluded that research and theory presented in the literature and the papers and uh, the textbooks, uh, they weren't really that memorable or useful to practitioners as they would like it to be. However, practitioners and researchers easily identified areas where higher, within higher education that needed ex additional exploration. Not surprisingly, I think they, the take-home message for me on, uh, on that work was that there was indeed still a research gap, the gap is still wide, uh, and we need to interrogate or question uh, why that's so after these many years. So we need to go back a little bit and look at how Sanders positioned us for this situation. And so in 1981, he came out with a piece, and in that, he has that quote that's up there on your screen, and you can see um, that the research tends to be an activity conducted by a class of professionals. And then practitioners are generally expected to depend on the research disseminated to them. It's a very passive language you see in this quote. The consequence is scientific studies tend to be reported to the specialized subgroup in which the investigator identifies Researchers identify with and publish for communities that do not include practitioners and vice versa. And that's, you know, that's going back 30 years ago, and so we really need to, to, to revisit this if we're feeling that we're in that same situation. Well, there's a nice picture of me. Um, last year, the Nakata Research Committee replicated this study at nine regional conferences. We're still in the process of analyzing the, the large amount of data that we generated from these in-depth conversations. However, at the conference in Chicago, we concentrated our analysis on two of the salient or prominent findings that were generated in the state. I'm going to talk about the first one, which is the role of academic advising, role of research in academic advising, and then Wendy's going to go on and talk about some of the barriers. Participants' understanding of the role of academic advising in the study um, really needs some context in order to understand sort of where they're coming from, how are they defining research, what does it mean to them when we use that word. Um, when we looked at the findings, we looked at the data, it suggested that the participants in the study were viewing research as part of the quote-unquote other, and namely faculty, uh, and they didn't see themselves as part of the research. It wasn't really in their purview or what they were, they see that as part of their, their responsibilities. They tended to describe research with a capital R that was situated somewhat firmly within the discovery paradigm, but that wasn't uniform, and there was a small and I think important voice um, in each of, the, each of the focus groups that detailed the use of how um, an individual or a unit was using data to inform decisions that might be traditionally couched in terms of assessment or program evaluation. The third part that jumped out uh, about the whole of research was, was very interesting. It was, um, it was this notion that, well, of course, higher education, so we needed to re use research. And one of the ways in which it could be used was to leverage for additional resources for advisors, advising program, or to justify a continuation of a particular program. The groups define research in tra rather traditional ways, you know, pointing first to the discovery research, and then including faculty and researchers as the producers of research. It often seemed from the transcripts that um, research was something that either happened, you know, happened to the students or happened to advisors, rather than being part of them. And that's an important piece to think about. In terms of the process, Participants describe something more into the research designed to inform practice with an emphasis on replication. 
And that that's a strong point there. One of it described it in this way, and I like the way that we frame this slide, is, and it's easy to kind of say, you look at, you identify, and I'll read you the quote directly. You look at the problem, you identify the problem, you do your search on the finding the solutions to address those specific problems, then you apply that research or that knowledge that you found to a specific population. Then you reevaluate. And if it works, you apply to the whole population or to the populations that need that particular application. Then you review it again to see whether or not it is actually doing what you want. The, the quote goes on, but I think you get the point there. They're describing, a, I think, the research process, one in which has a spiral to it, so you could use data to inform decision making. What I noticed in that quote was the many use. And up on your screen, it's kind of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven use. The interesting is that the, the, the uh, ref reference to you instead of the reference to I. I'm extending that finding a little too far for that particular quote. But I do think that finding it is, in fact, uh, seeing that, that you as someone else will be doing rather than I will be conducting first research is consistent with Kazar's findings. And the longstanding belief that practitioners use results but they're not considered generating research as part of their practice, at least not as an essential or integral part of the practice. Again, that's not to say that you know research doesn't inform practice, and that many advisors, and I would hopefully argue the most, the majority of advisors that I spend time with are advocates and consumers of research. Um, but many, um, and many find it important or integral in terms of their professional growth. So, how did other participants describe the way that they used research? Here's an example in terms of the consumer of research uh, finding. The participant says, I attended a session that was given by a large public university with the exact same college as the college that I'm employed in. Our student populations were similar. The research studies focused on probation students, and that's what she was interested in. And so she's making this case here, wow, this is a great example of something that I draw from, something that I can bring and, and, and replicate or can and bring back. And not necessarily just the practice. I can bring back the ways in which that was studied and try it in my, in my campus uh, in the context for which I'm in. Now, a counterpoint to that narrative emerged around this notion of a lack of culture for research and academic advising. There was a recognition that advisors and administrators need to wield the research stick at times to validate a position or to advocate for additional resources, but it didn't become situated as part of what we do as advisors. Here's a, a little bit of a summary of some of the quotes that we found. Um, Research provides the validation if you can gain credibility if you have the data. Another quote, and I'll read this one to you. When you work in higher education, and higher education is advised by research, it is the language. It's how resources are allocated. It's how things get valued. So that's a quick summary of the first major finding that we had in the study. And I'm going to shift it over to Wendy so she can um, kind of move on and talk a little bit about the second major finding that we talked about, which was some of the barriers, the real real barriers that are facing uh, advisors as they want to get involved in conducting research. Wendy? Thanks, Josh. Good afternoon, everybody. Hope you're staying warm. Uh, this really has been a fascinating process, uh, and the, the voices of NACADA members are coming through loud and clear uh, as we've gone through this process. So it appears that a lack of culture of research has convinced some administrators and advisors that they cannot conduct research. While it is not surprising that a lack of time emerged as the most salient barrier, the connection to a lack of research culture and a feeling that research was not valued by administrators was also prevalent in the data we found. A cursory look at the data and countless anecdotal encounters, uh, I'm sure you've heard this uh, or said it, suggests that if advisors only had more time, they would engage and consume research. But the data from the current study presents a more complex picture of expectations, responsibilities, and perceptions of capabilities within academic advisors uh, and administrators. Let's um, tackle that a little bit. The justi justification or rationale for time being the biggest barrier, of course, was linked to the add-on effect. And this is, this is not a small thing, because the descriptions of workload were couched in terms that precluded anything else added to an advisor's already full plate. Now beyond time to conduct research, participants pointed to the fact that advising was actually devalued in higher education 
and that it was not viewed as a profession or a discipline. The connection to a discipline or field of study, though, is essential given the definition of research presented by Josh. Participants further describe the culture perpetuated by the faculty per versus practitioner divide. Here's how one participant described it. This is a quote. They need to view us as professionals. Uh, they, I'm assuming, uh, meaning uh, faculty and administrators. Uh, this participant goes on to say, I could make the college a little bit better if given the opportunity. I think we also have to give ourselves permission to do those types of things and value ourselves as professionals. Now, beyond the issue of self-confidence for those in advising roles, uh, comments made during the focus groups revealed a more difficult cultural issue, and we're going to land on this for a little while uh, because we think it's something we need to address uh, out in the open. Uh, listen to these quotes. Here's one. In my role, we are seen as the lowly advisors. Get the students in, advise them successfully, and get them out. Faculty advisors are given more prestige, if you will, because they have the PhD and they've got the journals and the articles to back them up. Another participant said, the only people that are going to respect our PhD, I think advisors can be part of it, but research results are going to have to be written very well by top-notch researchers who have big names in academia. Another said it this way, I think one of the things is there is a divide between faculty advisors and people who do research. I don't know what that is. Is it just the difference between PhDs and the professional groups of advisors who don't think they can re do research or are qualified to do research? And that quote. Now, while these statements were made by single individuals and didn't necessarily represent the group at the event, uh, we, we certainly have heard these kinds of statements before. It's clear that there continues to be an uncomfortable acknowledgement of a class system in higher education, which usually, usually comes down to the real or perceived hierarchy between the haves, represented by faculty with advanced degrees and academic appointments, and the have-nots, staff who feel as though they're second-class citizens with no voice. So forgive me for being extreme here, but, but nowhere is that more evident than in the research realm, a place where faculty seem to live comfortably and others tend to dabble. So any initiative that attempts to bring academic advisors into the world must address not only the formal structures of university life, but the relevant and power, powerful implicit attitudes that may serve as a barrier to change. So to summarize this important theme, it's quite likely that the issue of time is merely a symptom of two bigger cultural issues within academic advising. Many respondents in the focus groups indicated a marked difference between the expectations and skill levels of faculty members in the area of educational research design and professional advisors who may not have entered the professional through disciplines and programs that require training in educational research. Many advisors, in fact, indicated a lack of confidence in being able to conduct research on their own. And while collaboration on research projects is encouraged in the faculty world, some advisors express frustration with colleagues who don't share their interest in exploring research opportunities. And by colleagues, they meant fellow advisors within their own unit or department. So it really started to, to wrap people out there. So some advisors feel like lone ranger and rarely move from an idea stage to try and get a research project rolling. Now, another interesting cultural theme emerged in the area of nature of advisors' work itself. This was revealed under the phrase, advisors are helpers, not researchers. So one respondent expressed it this way, quote, part of it for me is I don't know that part of the culture. When I came to work in advising, I entered as a helping professional. I have a counseling background. I'm not the researcher or a scientist. I'm a helper. I'm not sure that the research piece is part of the culture of advising, and so what you folks are doing maybe is starting to raise that. I don't know that in our job description there is anything about research. When we're looking for new staff people, I guess we're looking more for a counseling background or a student affairs background, end quote. Now, clearly, NACADA members collectively will need to address the cultural divide between faculty advisors and professional advisors 
and interesting how we are using those terms. Uh, so the field develops in a consistent and intentional direction. Now, rather than view this as a hurdle to be overcome, it might be better to see this as an opportunity to challenge the current status, create conditions for advisors to be empowered to expand their thinking about research, and to participate actively in redefining how research is situated in the field of advising. Now, this picture, that's me in the middle there, was taken at our recent annual conference in Chicago during our common reading session, a new initiative aimed at this purpose that Josh will be telling you more in just a bit. And of course, those of you who know Nakata's executive director, Charlie Nutt, will not be surprised to see him there cheerleading the process uh, in the background. Let me go, Charlie. Now we've laid out much of the context surrounding research and academic advising, as well as some of the perceived gaps between practitioners and scholars. But look, the work we do, all of our energy, should be directed towards students and their learning and development. We have an ethical obligation to do all that we can, to know all that we can about how much and how well our interventions are working toward academic and developmental success. Now, another sub theme in this area of defining research reveals that there's a little bit of confusion about the difference between the data used for program assessment purposes, much of which is gathered for basic reporting and accountability purposes, such as retention rates and contact hours, and data used to test and generate theory on learning and development. So one of the ways, of course, is to expand all this thinking is to start where you are. A lot of energy has been put into assessing academic advising and conducting evaluations of programmatic elements, elements of advising practice. Now, using the Boyer framework described earlier by Josh, we would situate then this kind of inquiry under the scholarship of application. If we start from the premise that in its purest form, program evaluation is educational research, then this does represent a good place from which to start. Now, program evaluation has all the elements critical to systematic inquiry, of course. We identify an educational pro problem or issue. We make predictions about the impact of chosen instructional and curricular strategies. We gather evidence, we document the results, we analyze the results, and then further action is recommended. So if program evaluation is considered research, it must be acknowledged that when done well, gaps and trends are revealed about the educational process, which should lead to substantive changes toward improvement. Unfortunately, though, too often assumptions are mistaken for knowledge. Advisors in particular work in a world every day where they know students. We see hundreds of them a week. We see case after case and trend after trend. The danger, though, is that the decisions that are made from a program perspective are much more hunch-based than evidence-based. But if the mirror is turned on the assumptions, they can turn into some really insightful research questions. Uh, as Josh mentioned earlier, Kazar makes the case that practitioners tend to generate the most appropriate research questions for study that points to action. Consider, though, the way that program evaluation is typically conducted. In fact, one uh, author said it this way, documenting improvements and tracing them to specific data obtained and to specific assessments is difficult. So in some ways, unfortunately, program evaluation and educational research flow in two different directions. In assessment, we hope to see improvements in learning and development, and then, it, and then we ask the question, what accounted for that? Uh, even doctoral students, uh, certainly that I, I see, say, I have a program that really works well, now how can I build a dissertation around it? So it's really a solution in search of a problem. And too often we do assessment in that way. We should set it up in a way that asks the important questions first and then design the interventions and strategies to affect change, all the while gathering appropriate and meaningful evidence to be analyzed later. In research design, of course, we ask the question, I wonder if this strategy will result in a change one way or the other on these things I'm most concerned with, or variables. And then we embark on a strategy to gather the evidence that reveals the change, if any, and in which direction. So if we look at program evaluation in the same way we look at educational research, 
we'd be positioned to satisfy those multiple audiences that uh, we were talking about earlier, including ourselves and our students as, of course, the most important recipients of the results. And if we approach focus research the same way we do program assessment, we better understand the big picture by gaining a deeper, more systematic understanding of the elements that make up the whole and how to better isolate the interactions between and among variables in an effort to draw conclusions that make sense based on the questions and the methodology. The research questions then themselves will lead to the appropriate methodologies and designs that we can then link to the conclusions. Um, good designs such as action research, qualitative inquiry, and correlational studies. It all depends on the questions and the format we're trying to ask them. It's important for advisors then to gain skills and knowledge in the concepts of basic research design, or at least to understand research designs and to become critical consumers of the literature. The most important commodity that any educator has is time. So the faster we can identify the critical elements of a research article and be able to analyze it, especially related to, as I said earlier, the appropriateness of the, method, appropriateness of the methodology, is related to the research questions, then the more quickly it can be ascertained as to whether the conclusions merit further exploration and has application and relevancy to you in your local context. So I'll turn the mic back over to Josh now, and he's going to tell you about some current strategies uh, and resources for infusing research throughout the college. Josh? Thanks, Wendy. Um, you know, to this point, you know, we're sort of laying the, sort of fr the framework or laying a foundation for uh, what, do we, what do we know so far and, and uh, starting to kind of uh, set, the, set the pieces. The other piece, is, of course, is that Nakata has a, a number of resources and um, supports for people interested in conducting research. So I'm going to go over a few of those uh, for you right now. Uh, the first is the development and publication of a new uh, monograph. Uh, you'll see it on your screen here, the Scholarly Inquiry of Academic Advising. Uh, my picture shouldn't be up there. There should be the picture of the three editors because they are leading this charge. And I'm so pleased that uh, uh, Peter Hagen and uh, Terry uh, Kuhn and Gary Paddock uh, are, are working with Marsha Miller and the executive office to put this important piece together. The first full draft of the chapters, the chapters is listed there on your screen, is due in late January. And we're hoping that the monograph comes out probably spring 2010. You should never say that with a publication because it may not make that cut, but pull, we're, we're pulling for it. Um, but the purpose of the book, and I do believe it's going to serve as an excellent resource uh, for the membership in a variety of arenas. I could see it being used in the, in the certificate programs, the master's program, and, and used uh, as a kickoff to some, uh, some sessions at different uh, conferences, which is really related to another exciting initiative, um, the Nakata Common Reading Program. Uh, Janet Schoenberg, who is on the research committee, uh, is at Penn State, and another group uh, at University of Pittsburgh really started this off as a pilot in Region 2, and then it became a, a hit uh, at the Nakata Annual in Chicago. Um, and it really involves the membership uh, engaged in uh, not just reading, but in the critical discussion of scholarly literature in academic advising. You know, the program uh, is designed to encourage advisors to become regular consumers of scholarly literature and reinforcing the importance of scholarly engagement through reading and, and most important, that discussion element. Uh, we're all, you know, taking time out to do the reading, but where are we building in that time to, to discuss it and to challenge one another and to think critically uh, about the, not just the quality of the scholarship that's being produced, but the, the inherent uh, take-home messages or takeaways from that. One of the things that, that the hope is, is that we are using this as a springboard or a launching pad so that advisors are recognizing the, the connections to theoretical perspectives across the variety of disciplines, informing some ideas for their own research, and, and of course, recognizing really the gaps in, in, the, in the literature. And then kind of saying, just as we said, well, what, what about this? Or I wonder, how can we expand this? How can we think differently? How does this work? Um, and I think that's going to be a great catalyst to, to infusing inquiry uh, throughout, the, throughout the cup. And you can see that picture there is just an example of the small groups and, and just the, the numbers of people. I don't know what was total, but it was uh, several hundred. The third component that we're looking at is inclusion or infusion, maybe, a bit better put, of um, uh, research within the Nakata Institute. And those Nakata Institutes are the Administrators Institute, the Assessment Institute, and the Summer Institute. These activities are attended by over 400 uh, 
practitioners, advisors, faculty, everybody uh, from the Nakata community uh, each year and our extended opportunity to spend time uh, really critically and, and in timely engagement in discussions uh, around different topical areas according to the three uh, components. By addressing research at these institutes, uh, one of the goals there is to kind of communicate the value of research within Nakata and then for the members who are attending to again bring that back uh, to their home institution. There's been some communication already with the advisory boards and they're the ones who help put together the curriculum and kind of you know, give the final approval on what's going to be covered in the institutes and they're very receptive. Um, and um, Sharon Aiken is going to be working on that uh, along, um, along with others, Rich Robbins and others. And so we're very excited about that. We're hoping by 2010 there'll be a research component at each of these institutes. The last part uh, is the development of a two-day research symposium. And this will be piloted in uh, Starkville, Mississippi uh, in, in March. And so we have a, a slide uh, there that shows a um, connection to how you can become part of that. The goal there is to bring together emerging or burgeoning advising scholars for a, a day and a half of intensive discussion of methodology. And equally important is creating that timeline, uh, going back to the barriers that were mentioned by Wendy in the research study, creating the timeline for going ahead and completing the inquiry. We're hoping that the participants bring clearly articulated questions, so we already have the questions sort of fleshed out, and some ideas around methodology. And then we'll work as a group and have some one-on-one -on -one support to really push that inquiry further, to really you know, interrogate the, the underlying assumptions of, and what's going to need to happen, steps one, two, three, right on to um, the publication of, of that research. We've been talking for quite a while now, um, and some of you might be saying, well, where's research stuff? Where's the, where's the tools and stuff? Um, but we've really felt strong that it was important to, you know, really situate this webinar into where we are currently in the field um, and, and sort of launch in and, and sell this as a how-to because it, it's not enough time to do justice to that. And so I think we're going to spend the rest of the time giving you some examples and walking you through. But this really is foundation um, that will kind of get us started and trying to help think of those as moving along the practitioner researcher continuum in academic advising. As you'll see in the later people who know me, I'm not big on those continuums, uh, on the dichotomies rather, I am big on continuum, being how we position ourselves and where the flexibility is to move um, um, to and fro the continuum. Well, speaking of continuums, um, one of the, the, the areas that we need to spend more energies on creating a continuum getting away from the quantitative versus qualitative dichotomy or debate. I really like that slide um, because I'm the one who's sad on both sides because the only people in that debate uh, are, are winning are possibly a select number of faculty who are you know, arguing about those. Who are the losers or who does not benefit from that? Um, that that's, that's students and graduate students and their families in P20. Um, so the debate between the value and contribution of different research designs, lenses, frameworks, however you want to describe them, is really long-standing. If, if you look at any um, program of a conference, you'll see that there's a clear line of demarcation between the types of inquiry that are conducted, and it's somewhat field-specific. And beyond that, I think the federal government has kind of weighed in and said uh, what they value in terms of research designs um, and privileging uh, random clinical trials. Uh, of the experiments, the design, uh, in, um, and the notion of the what works clearinghouse is to decide what is good research. I think that's a limiting uh, venture, uh, and I'm not sure how long that will, will last. Um, so let's put the funded research aside for a moment. I don't want to get off track there. Uh, but the debate about what data collection or analysis methods are preferred is, a, I think, is a good one to have. I believe that you know the the animosity or the debates that are there uh, comes from the false dichotomy that we either have one a quantitative approach or a qualitative approach. Some students and I have been working on this continuum, and I've shared it with a few different views um, in trying to get some feedback on people's take on this. And this really asking people to not just say, "Well, I have a quantitative approach or a qualitative approach," but to really help position as best as you can, when you use a term, a phrase, a construct, where does it fit a continuum? And where, where could we even further extend that? 
And in the chapter I'm going to work on for the monograph, I'm going to try to also extend that by going into some other literature that I'm just you know, getting comfortable with to further extend from the social science model to really be inclusive of other domains. So let's take a look at some of these terms up here and see if we can challenge even this current vision of what's, uh, of what's on this continuum. For example, most of my students, when they use the word interview, they kind of place it between, I'd say right between the very middle and toward the qualitative. Some of them will position it purely in the qualitative, and, and that's where they want to start. Most kind of hit right in that middle. You see where that left arrow, uh, that's not stage left, yeah, left arrow is. And they're, and they're saying, yeah, I think it's kind of in there. But now if you look at the way that the analysis procedures happen, I've seen many interview uh, you know, a very strongly qualitative, following a very more qualitative tradition about how the interviews are conducted. But yet when it comes to the analysis, it very much moves toward the quantitative side. And I'm thinking of Miles and Huberman and others um, who go ahead and what you call count codes. And so they'll count the number of times that a word or a phrase that was coded. And then they'll do a statistical analysis on that. So placing interview on the qualitative side of the continuum is limiting for that particular approach. We should be flexible enough to appreciate how it can be used effectively across the continuum. Other terms can be that are seemingly firmly situated on one side can be interrogated for their practice. But one of the ones that I really uh, a stickler about is this notion of, of bias. And on the previous slide, you'll see that um, you know bias is situated in the middle. Most students and most people I would always say, well, that's the qualitative. Of course, you have to be worried about bias in qualitative research. But if you look at a research, research journals and quantitative, you rarely see a section of that study that has that term investigator perspective, which is really what I like to use and what I like people to think of. What is your perspective? Why are you interested in this particular topic? And I would like to see uh, all research journals and all uh, reports that are generated really situate the researcher into the study. Where, why did you decide on this topic? What is your interest, whether vested or neutral or outside? What is your role uh, in terms of your position that led you to this inquiry? I think that's important for the readers to, to understand so they can develop a sense of trustworthiness and not let numbers stand on their own as being the indicator of objectivity, let's say. <clears throat> but another reason uh, I think we're kind of having this debate or, or having this uh, the situation where researchers uh, are stuck in one area is because often our training in the training of graduate programs is uh, my methods or the methods of my major professor. And I liken that to, well, that's, that's all I know. That's how I was trained, so that's what I'm going to do. And the Carnegie Initiative on the doctorate and other independent outlets on research have suggested that, indeed, graduate training is lacking both in breadth and in depth as it relates to inquiry. And I think as we move into being a, a, a strong player in higher education uh, in terms of research in academic advising, we need to be mindful of that, that we appreciate the continuum, we appreciate the variety of designs that are out there, and that we, uh, we grow as researchers. I'm going to turn it back over to Wendy. Thanks, Josh. That's a pretty strong statement, statement of course, that uh, graduate training is, is lacking in, in breadth and depth. And of course, you know, students in grad programs uh, should have a voice in, in finding ways to link research with practice. Um, and though it's true that, that some programs are designed better than others toward that goal, uh, not all PhD programs are the same at different types of institutions and within disciplines. So uh, buyer beware, I guess. Now, on the other hand, there are, of course, a number of other opportunities for advisors who are not in formal graduate programs to gain skills in, in research methods. Uh, faculty and staff from discipline with strong research, research methods courses, uh, as well as institutional research and assessment offices on your campuses, are, are generally happy to conduct workshops with practitioners uh, on campus for the purpose of professional development. Uh, the most useful and relevant activities often involve advisors and fellow researchers sitting in the same room and working through real-life situations and educational problems. For example, here are two questions, very simple questions, that would get you started. First, what do you wonder about as you work with students? And second, what trends do you see day after day? 
So starting to articulate those and describing those uh, helps really get that down uh, for further analysis. Uh, so if given the opportunity and the time, how many research topics could you come up with? And we're going to throw a few out later that were generated by NACADA members at the focus groups. And, and, you know, really the number and scope of topics within the world of academic advising is staggering. Uh, but where do you take those ideas? And how do you go about gathering support and evidence for answering those questions? And at what point, and this is really important, are your discoveries considered valid enough for you to share with others? So as Josh, Josh um, suggested earlier when presenting Boyer and Schulman's work, uh, if advising is teaching, I've got that sticker on my door, then the nature of uh, some of the research, probably most of the research in academic advising, would fall under the category scholarship of teaching and learning. Here at Illinois State, we use a simple definition, which is systematic analysis of teaching and learning made public. And it's the uh, made public part that's, that's a really important part of this. The first most important audience, of course, for the results of your research must be those intended to help, namely your students. But knowledge hidden under a rock violates the very purpose of education. So deeper, better understanding of teaching and learning process is meant to be shared. Additionally, uh, some of your colleagues have some wonderful suggestions for collaboration, both within and outside of an institution. I want to take a second to, um, to give you some, some direct quotes from the focus groups on this. Uh, here's what one person said. I've worked with our research office to define research projects for students in my classes, and I've gone to them and said, what do you have sitting on a shelf that you haven't had time to do? Let me put a group of students on it to record it, research it, and do a research paper on it for you. We could give you the hand. Another participant said, uh, I could see some value in possibly having mini grants to support faculty and others focusing on advising, coming up with their own research questions. Perhaps then we could also engage our undergraduate students in research. This is something that could be uh, collaborative, letting the questions come from them, letting them do the research, and inform the greater university community. Uh, some institutions are lucky enough then to have some faculty development money or professional development money and uh, research and professional growth opportunities. Um, don't have to be big amounts. Uh, but it could be to do a lot to, um, to encourage collaborative research. Uh, another person said, I think getting one small enthusiastic team going could be very contagious. I see our less experienced faculty and staff having passion to do things like that. It would be great to have students in cross-disciplinary colleges make presentations uh, at NACADA. And I might add, uh, one of the, the Winter Institute um, uh, in um, what was it, San Antonio, I think, um, had a, a three or four students who, who attended that, that uh, Nakata Institute, uh, and uh, they were instant stars. They, they did a wonderful job. Um, finally, one participant expressed the importance of this issue at the administrative level, uh, noting, this is a quote, it seems like higher education is not often collaborative because we compete to have honors and awards and recognition around campus to get dollars. Uh, and at this campus, they have uh, some administrators in very key positions from the president on down that uh, are really uh, encouraging uh, collaboration and, and just using the term, let's ask each other. Let's get around tables and talk. Uh, for this participant, it was a new voice that, that was heard on that campus. and, and uh, in, in that way, they um, really encouraged uh, not only collaboration, but trust. Um, so sitting down and talking about it was a really important, uh, important piece. Uh, and then what, they, what this participant noticed, noted is that, uh, that this perspective would lead to an openness to know an individual better, or people that they work with or get to know know their expertise, know their thoughts, learning from people in other areas, not just focus solely on a discipline or from within a position, and then kind of value that voice and are more willing to hear uh, other things, whether it's research or other things they put together. Then they can uh, propose studies on that. And this participant ended by saying, solid initiatives can come out of something that doesn't appear to be academic discipline-based, 
or whether you're faculty or staff. So the collaboration piece done in a way that's supported by administration and thought by like-minded professionals seems like a way to address the problems with the us versus them divide. So let's go back to our lenses and our initial framework um, presented almost an hour ago now. Uh, and just we're just wondering if anything has triggered uh, any thoughts for you. So let's go back to this. So once again, consider the position that you're in. So how does the type of advising that you do, or you work with first year students, non-majors, majors, graduate students, uh, how does this encourage research topics to relate to those uh, those students and those uh, levels of education. Consider the problem you're trying to solve. Uh, given tight resources and the desire for deep and broad impact on teaching and learning, what strategies, programs, or initiatives tend to work, and what evidence do you have for continuing, revising, stopping, or celebrating for that matter? Consider the proof that you're being asked to show. What side out outside pressures do you feel? And how can elements of program evaluation and assessment be expanded or directed to provide a focus for research. Conclusions that are drawn as a result of rigorous and systematic inquiry will carry much more weight than anecdotes and hunches, regardless of your passion and dedication to your students. And of course, consider, uh, consider the collaborations that you're a part of. Professional educators working together on research projects provide multiple benefits for all concerned, particularly for the students you serve. And as we mentioned, some of you uh, are or will be involved in graduate, uh, formal graduate training, uh, whether it's a master's or doctoral level. Using advisor-related topics for class projects is the ultimate double dip, and everyone benefits from the multiple lenses applied to these relevant topics and contributes to the body of knowledge in the field. So let me give you an example quickly that includes a lot of these uh, points uh, here at Illinois State. Uh, the results of a program evaluation activity uh, re revealed a number of students who had struggled to successfully complete their first year here. Now, based solely on their review of entry characteristics, which is generally a type of a regression-based uh, predictive success model, it was assumed that these students would be successful and should have had little difficulty with their academic coursework, but this proved not to be the case as they ended their first year. The academic advisor then embarked upon a research project to try to uncover whether there were evidentiary factors that could help explain the phenomenon. So the purpose of this study was to explore those elements of the first year experience that students related to academic success or, or challenges to academic success. Participants uh, were chosen based on their pre-college variables, those that are usually used at most institutions to make a determination of an admissions decision and their cumulative GPA at the end of their first year of study, uh, which in this case were those barely above a 2.0, just enough, uh, in other words, to keep them off of probationary status. In essence, the advisor uh, who became a researcher and happens to be a NACADA member, her name is Susan Woolen, uh, sought out students who returned to the institution for their second year, but who had not been as successful as they should have been, according to their academic entry characteristics. So using a qualitative research design, which is, which is really probably more a mixed method design because it followed a quantitative phase to establish the purposeful sample, uh, interviews were conducted with the students who agreed to participate. And, and this is a good example, by the way, of, of a, uh, a student, a professional who really wanted to do a quantitative uh, methodology, felt most comfortable in that arena, but her research questions just kept pushing her to a qualitative approach because she really needed to know what was going on uh, with these students and needed to hear from them. Uh, so she talked to them. Uh, wonderful concept. Uh, so the questions that she asked them uh, focused not only on the gap between the student's expectation of college and experiences in the first year, but also on personal reflections about themselves as learners and the extent to which both the institution, meaning faculty, staff, and our, the campus environment, and the student, uh, the decisions and behaviors of, of the student, had an impact on their academic success. Uh, really interesting and relevant themes emerged from the interviews uh, that have helped the academic advisors and faculty in the department that Susan worked in 
uh, to develop what they're, what they're calling a model for first-year student success that's grounded in theory with all the big names, Aston, Tinto, Ku, and others, is scholarly, uh, resulting in this case in a master's thesis and some future uh, publications and presentations, and most importantly, is relevant to the local context. The results are being used within the academic advising process to facilitate learning and development of current and future first-year students. Using the findings of program evaluation, in this case the school's approach to supporting high-achieving students in the first year, to improve practice of the relevant stakeholders represents an essential component of effective program and evaluation that leads to action. Now, Susan, by the way, found, uh, in case you're wondering about the results, that these students struggled in their first year not because of what, what we might brainstorm. Uh, we think are the reasons like too much partying or poor time management skills or, or really even because of poor study skills. They actually uh, overwhelmingly talked about not how they studied but where they studied that mattered. Uh, so each of them, and these were individual interviews, this was not a focus group, uh, discovered that they needed to get out of the residence hall, and we addressed that with the residence hall folks, uh, and into quiet places like the library, imagine that, or the uh, or a coffee house, for example, to be able to concentrate better. And then they found that they were able to really pick it up and um, were able to come back to the institution the second year. And they're doing very well, by the way. We followed up on that in a little bit. Uh, now, the limitations associated, associated with program evaluation activities are similar in nature to the traditional research paradigm but may include additional challenges. Uh, evidence gathered for one purpose, of course, is not always useful or relevant for a secondary purpose, and care must be taken to document the conditions under which different types of data are generated in order to validate appropriate methods of analysis. Uh, research gen uh, projects that involve data generated for the purpose of a study also takes time and some expertise in the areas of methods and strategy. Now, the good news is that the skills and abilities used for systematic, useful program evaluation and assessment are the same as those used to conduct scholarly educational research. Uh, academic advisors have a responsibility to contribute to the profession as well as to base their continuing work with students on, and this is a quote by Paul Vogt, up-to-date knowledge gained from research in their fields. And I might add that, that um, the last quote uh, by Paul Vogt um, uh, comes from a book called Quantitative Research Methods for, for, for Professionals, a recent publication that if, if you want a book on the shelf that gets you into uh, quantitative methods in a language that um, <laughs> is understandable and readable, uh, get that one. And it was fun to find out in the last week or two, uh, working with Josh on this, that Paul was actually a mentor for him at University of Albany. And um, Paul finished his career here at Illinois State and is currently working on uh, grant projects within our, our Center for Educational Policy. That's, so that's been fun. But a great book, uh, one by, I might add, that he wanted to, to call uh, uh, being a critical consumer of research, some, something like that in the title. Uh, so that's a good example. But uh, Josh, I think you have another example of a good research project for us. Yes, I do, Wendy, and I am looking at my bookshelf, and there's Paul's book right there. Uh, I really appreciated his support for me when I was a student at the University of Albany. Um, you know, my, my greatest uh, achievement, there are three of them. <laughs> um, one of is uh, working at the uh, advising center at the University of Albany. It really taught me how to be, uh, how to be a professor and how to be a uh, professional. Um, and one of the things we were interested back then uh, was trying to understand the similarities and differences of students' perceptions of advising. And we're also interested in their overall experiences, of course, but we really were kind of coming around to these conversations that just kept coming up and um, wondering if, if they really understood what it is we're supposed to do or what is our role. Uh, and, and like you may have had in many of your conversations, they just weren't getting it, particularly the first, uh, first year students. And so you're kind of Lamenting the fact that they, they weren't getting it, uh, we wanted to really investigate a little bit more intentionally um, whether or not our perceptions of their perceptions, let's try that one out, um, uh, of, their, of the role of the academic advisors uh, was aligned, let's say. So we conducted this study. Um, we, were, we conducted a series of focus group conversations in the residence halls, providing pizza, of course. 
sausage, pepperoni, cheese, or veggie. Um, and we learned quite a bit. And it was really an, an exciting process, and it allowed us to kind of get out of our offices and allowed to see, see us in the, in the residence halls. And so it had many also uh, positive unintended effects. Uh, you know, the students were pleased with their experiences with their individual advisor, as well as the advising center as a whole. And I guess the take-home message that we, we found there was is when the students' perceptions of the role of advising differed from ours, they weren't so happy. And the perceptions of advising in general uh, were not. Um, so let me go through the steps that we took uh, in order to, to generate or do this thing. First, we spent a lot of time sort of articulating what is the question? What do we want to get at here? What is this overarching query? And we wanted to basically elicit uh, their voice, the student voice, on uh, our phenomenon of interest, uh, which was first-year students' perceptions of advising, uh, or student perceptions of advising at that time. At the same time, parallel to that, we had to examine the literature, find out what's out there. Uh, and we went to the Nakata Journal and other outlets to find and help situate our study. We looked at potential theories that help guide our understanding uh, of how students, in terms of both their transition to college, but also their experiences with adults in the campus, et cetera, and their prior experiences in, in, in their K-12 environment. Um, at any time, again, all these things are sort of simultaneously changing and, and modifying as we go along. Um, we had to generate the actual focus group protocol, which included this introductory script to explain what we were doing, why we were in the residence halls, bribing them with pizza. Uh, we had to generate the actual questions that were asked them, the specific focus group questions, and then the sub prompts or the follow up questions to help further understand. A lot of those questions uh, for me uh, are always, can you give me an example of that? So we have this question to elicit perceptions, and then the student will say something. But they want to try to get at an experience or a further story so we can really help understand how, they're, uh, how they apply or they're contextualizing their thinking about uh, perceptions. We also had to submit um, the IRB application, Institutional Review Board, to ensure uh, we were protecting the rights of the participants, and that was approved. And at the same time, again, we're trying to figure out who should we study or who, who Whose perspective do we really want in this? Now, early on, we wanted a little cross-section of sophomores, freshmen, potentially even juniors who were still being advised in the advising center, which was working primarily with uh, students who had yet to decide, uh, formalize the major. Um, but we landed back on first-year students because really the heart of all those conversations that came up over and over again. So once we decided on the sample section, we reached out to our partners in residential life and they were willing and, and very helpful in arranging the special sample of students to go out and, and spend some time with them in the residence halls. Each focus group lasted about an hour and had about eight to ten participants. We audio taped the, the conversation and transcribed it verbatim, and we conducted an, uh, an analysis using an inductive process, um, kind of an open coding strategy where we went through each of the individual transcripts, multiple people and thinking through what are they really trying to say here. What does this quote mean? What is this, what was the student really trying to capture? And we were kind of coding those as we went along, and then we were trying to move from the code, open coding structure to a more actual coding or a clustering of where are we seeing these patterns uh, emerge. We did that within each transcript, and then with the cross, the multiple transcripts, uh, within case analysis, if you will, and then the cross case, and then we identified what we felt to be the salient themes in terms of the student's perception. I later on uh, went and looked at the data in a little bit different uh, framework and, and situated in another uh, type study that was submitted and accepted in the Nakata Journal, and you'll see it's on your screen there, and it is in, available for, uh, for your, uh, in your resources. So let me turn it back to Wendy. Thanks, Josh. Uh, so now, where do we go from here as we start to uh, wrap this, this up in the next uh, 15 or 20 minutes? Um, how can we get better at in, infusing research deeper into our work? Uh, here are a few suggestions for places to start. This isn't rocket science. Um, of course, uh, national and institutional level, there are formal professional development programs. Uh, and certainly under the transparency of full disclosure here, we encourage you to attend NACADA events uh, whenever possible. It's, uh, I've been so impressed in the few years that I've been involved with the organization about what a wonderful resource um, NACADA is. Uh, some of you, of course, will or are enrolled in former, formal graduate programs where you're being trained in research methods. And whenever possible, you should work advising related topics into your coursework. 
Uh, do your best according to your schedule to attend or, or organize workshops on your own campus. Uh, and see if we can find partners to help with that. Uh, some campuses are blessed to have centers for teaching and learning, and we certainly hope that you have a professional development committee within your own campus advising network. Uh, and don't forget, by the way, that your friends in the College of Education are pretty good at this stuff, too. Of course, in your everyday world, uh, take advantage of departmental uh, or unit-based initiatives. Uh, encourage a common reading activity uh, within your department. Uh, choose articles that are relevant to your context. There are a ton of them on the Nakata site and, of course, uh, searchable uh, in a lot, a lot of engines uh, uh, on, your, on your campus, uh, in your computer, I should say. Uh, and ask for help in the methodology section if you need to. One, one of the things we heard from the focus group participants uh, was that they had a common reading program, but nobody quite knew how to to handle the methodology section, and so they got kind of stymied. Um, just ask for ask for some help in that. There, will be, there would be plenty of people on campus that could, could help get started. Uh, have deeper discussions about program assessment, as we talked about earlier. Oh, what do you need to know more about? Uh, this will likely have a different focus every year, but that's okay. Um, some of your most important questions, uh, could some of them be framed under a research design model? And of course, we're preaching to the choir here, to all of you, but take upon yourself um, to learn, to, to, to take advantage of any opportunity uh, through Nakata, which provides a wealth of resources on the website and in publication form. Uh, go ahead and take a stab at conducting many projects uh, to know more and assume less about what's happening uh, with your students. You don't have to solve the mysteries of the universe with each project. Uh, start small, and you're likely to be more successful uh, of course, when you try, then if you try to do a dissertation level work your first time out. Find other individuals who like this kind of thing and start some focused conversations on learning and development within the advising context. Uh, the important thing is to schedule time for it, which, which doesn't mean cancel student appointments. Uh, you can do it at lunch, uh, coffee, happy hour, whatever. These are really fun conversations to have. Really fun. Capital F, fun. And this, is, this has been an ongoing theme here this afternoon, uh, collaborate. Uh, the use of research teams is really the best way to divide the labor and tap into the strengths of each member. Uh, a research project is a multifaceted entity. It requires conceptual thinkers, methodologists, editors, data gather, gatherers, uh, literature sleuths, and, and few of us have all those skills at once. And don't forget that students are a wonderful resource at all points of the research process. Uh, attend research-related sessions on campus and at uh, professional meetings. There are plenty of them at Nakata events. Uh, advocate for more attention in your department or unit to the value of using and conducting research. And, and so if you're a supervisor, uh, determine how this work would fit into your staff professional development plan and ultimately perhaps the performance review process. This would go a long way to address the challenges or barriers our focus group participants express concerning unclear expectations for their for advisors uh, and their role in research. Well, time is rapidly getting away from us, so before we move to the question and answer period, uh, let's take, take a couple of minutes and look at some ideas of hot topics for research that we started from our focus groups, and these are just a few. You can see pretty quickly that each topic has multiple arms that could be tackled through systematic uh, inquiry. So let's just look at um, the ones on this list. Uh, the first one on the list is learning styles and college readiness issues. Now this goes back to the import importance of focusing your research not only on the students you serve, but uh, also perhaps on institutional and curricular characteristics. Uh, for example, how different are students um, at a place where the student enters a major right off the bat rather than uh, into a general education program? What about undeclared students? Do they tend to have too many interests and can't narrow them? Or do they have no idea what they're interested in? Uh, what about students who need developmental courses prior to their credit-bearing program? What about stu adult students returning to college after two decades or coming to college for the first time? 
What about first generation students and their challenges? What's the nature of their challenges? Is it simply a college as a second language issue or do these students have unique characteristics that can be identified and attended to intentionally? So that might lead us then to a whole range of related studies on the impact of advising strategies on learning and development. There's a lot written about which strategies or models work best with which types of students. Uh, so a systematic study, replicable study on the impact of intentional approaches like uh, prescriptive, developmental, and, intr and intrusive models will add to the body of knowledge uh, in the field of academic advising. Of course, uh, validating current practices is an assessment and evaluation related topic uh, that really does link our first two points here, but with a different audience, different audience in mind uh, and often related to resources and policy implications. So there's a ton more to be explored there, uh, but let's move on. Uh, Josh, can you tell us about uh, the rest of those on the list? Sure, Wendy. I'm going to go through a few of these and uh, leave time for questions, but I think uh, let me start with this advisor advisee relationship. Uh, a lot of the things on this list, what someone might consider hot topics, are really speaking um, you know, to some co collaborative inquiry or an inquiry project that, that may take some time and may take uh, you know, several months to, to accomplish uh, and they, they have a uh, density to them. Um, I want to talk a little bit about in some of these hot topics here how we can situate uh, in the frame of practitioner research or action inquiry, as I like to say, uh, and stick on this advisor advisee relationship question. I think we uh, often encounter uh, students uh, in, in situations where uh, we, we're not making the connection. Something's not happening. Uh, we have a framework that guides our advising. We, we have a shared vision of what advising looks like for our, our unit and then for me as an individual advisor. But once in a while, I connect with a student and interact with them, and eh, it's just not working. So. What, what do I need to do and what kind of changes in my practice for this particular student uh, might work? Well, we do that all the time. We make those changes and, and you know, say, oh, yeah, that was there or that wasn't so good. But what if we systematically and intentionally studied a change in uh, the way in which we approach the student or help the student make a change in the way he or she approaches us and then documented the impact of that, of that change? I could see it happening in, in just a very short amount of time. And I did something similar to that when I was in, in Albany. I'm not going to go into do much depth in terms of how I approached that, that inquiry process, but it really helped me see that if I intentionally made a change in the way that I interacted with a few students who came in who just kind of rubbed me the wrong way, and I spent a little extra time documenting the extent to which I implemented my change, which was going out into the lobby and greeting them, in my cheery face that you see on the screen there, and um, really um, maybe overselling uh, some of the points and, and listening, you know, taking extra time to listen, realized well, in hindsight and through the documentation that it was somewhat of my, my attitude and my behavior was changing the nature of that advisee advisor relationship. So I was able to study that with three or two or three students and that helped improve my practice when I kind of confronted this, what I call the typical student who just doesn't it doesn't get along with me. We just don't click. And so that example of a, a research process, an action inquiry process that ultimately helps the student, ultimately helps you improve as a professional. The next one there, working with parents. Um, you know, we, 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 we come, come about a challenge of, well, how involved should parents be? What is the nature of involvement? And I think you work that through in terms of some policies you have in your unit or with the as an individual advisor. But it might be worth um, studying that a little bit and seeing if the impact uh, is positive that you have on either your policy or your approach. I could also think of a, you know, our stereotypical helicopter parents, as we like to call them. I really haven't thought of inquiry to explaining what exactly that means. Who gets to fit in that category? Is that a phenomenon or is that a, and is that a, a advisor generated phenomenon? Do the parents themselves see themselves being intrusive and, and, and that's okay for them. I'd like to see some research conducted that get the voices of those parents as we define them into the, into the literature and into our hands so we can then respond or we can clarify the role of advising for them in a more, again, intentional way that's backed with some, uh, with some inquiry. 
A few more of these is high tech, high touch. We're, we're in the age where our students are, um, you know, well beyond email. How are we making the transition um, to the, geez, I'm just still getting into the 20th century, but how are we getting into the 21st century here in terms of how fast and how uh, effective the students are with technology, where its impacts positive or otherwise as vis-a-vis -vis, uh, building relationships, uh, responding appropriately uh, to advisors. If you get an email at 2.30 in the morning, you know what I'm talking about here. And so where is the inquiry that's helping define how can we understand uh, the technology and its impact on, on those relationships that high, that high touch. The last two, again, I think move away from this more action or uh, action inquiry or practitioner inquiry, uh, scholarly inquiry toward uh, retention studies and policy studies, which again, I don't want to downplay here. We are in a, a critical area where we need to be demonstrating the positive impact of effective advising practices on student retention. Uh, student trajectory into the major, and ultimately some policies that can be generated to help form uh, others in higher education, how they might go about doing um, doing this kind of research. Um, looks like our time is just about running out. So um, Josh and uh, Wendy, it looks like you have kept everybody pretty much glued to the screen because we have not had any questions come in, but I will uh, Put up your email addresses on this screen here for just a second uh, so that if any of our participants um, today would like to email questions after. We did have just one question that came in prior to the event from one of our uh, researchers uh, or persons that was interested in doing action research. Um, they'd heard that term mentioned. Uh, would you be willing to explain just that a little bit more about what that term action research means for folks? Wendy, let's start with you. Uh, sure, I, I, I love action research because it's, it's uh, really an umbrella that um, can um, that can pull lots of different types of methodologies and, and tools and techniques of inquiry uh, into it. The, the most important component for me is the action part, um, and that is that um, that it really is where discovery research, as we talked about earlier, uh, it really is meant to um, uh, to add to knowledge in the field, to generate theory. Uh, action research is really intended to inform practice, and that's where uh, practitioners live. Um, as, as little time as we have um, to, to do uh, this, and we're really obligated to get better at it. Um, Sorry, I don't know if I'm picking up the vacuum cleaner. I'll try to ignore that timing. Um, we really need to do research that has implication to it. Uh, so quite often when uh, when I do my own types of action research or what the students do, uh, the final research question uh, in, in that uh, activity is literally, so what implications does this have for uh, fill in the blank? and, and um, uh, the, the other part of the, that, that that really is matters to me is that as uh, long as you document what you're doing uh, and are rigorous and systematic about it, um, you know you can you can make adjustments along the way based on the evidence that that you're getting. Uh, Josh, you have anything to add to that? I know you do a lot of action research in your area. Yeah, thanks, Wendy. I'll just add to that um, the importance of considering that as a more short-term inquiry that directly impacts practice, uh, again, in a just-in-time manner, where you're able to conduct a study from start to finish um, by identifying the, the research question, implementing or thinking through um, the phenomenon of interest, and then using data to change practice. Uh, I might go in that notion of spiral. Uh, I use that term spiral, so you keep, you're, it never ends. Uh, that's daunting in a sense, but because you're always learning more, um, you can be more or less uh, systematic in how you collect and maintain the data as you go along. But once you've gotten through a research process, you really have the tools to then uh, apply that to different areas. I would might go so far as, as to suggest that I think um, that it is essential for uh, advisors to um, 
think about and conduct action search as part of their professional development and part of their practice. It really will provide excellent um, data for staff meetings, for meetings with supervisors, uh, and it also provides sort of an evidence of, of affirmation for the process and the types of uh, things you're engaged in. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm certainly an advocate of that approach within a larger framework of inquir scholarly inquiry and academic advising. Uh, and again, uh, our emails are up there, and I would invite anybody to contact me um, or Wendy at any time to, to further that. That's an area which I think I will continue to uh, learn and talk with uh, advisors in Nakata to further that agenda as we move forward. So now we would like to thank Wendy and Josh for sharing their um, great expertise with us today and also all of the work that they've been doing for all of us over um, these past few years to bring this material together. It's just been a tremendous work of gathering and organizing all of the material um, for this broadcast as well as the many, many initiatives that are coming up in the future. So Josh, Wendy, on behalf of the association, thank you for all of the work that you're doing for us all. And again, we thank all of our participants for being with us today. We look forward to interacting with you in many future events. If you have any questions about this broadcast or future events, please be sure to visit the Nakata website. Or feel free to contact me directly by phone or by email. We look forward to seeing you next time.